Welcome. Today we're discussing uh, the channel, channel modeling uh, and testing rate versus range in, in a real fading channel with the model specified by the IEEE. And today our speakers are Steve Shear, our chief scientist, and Prachi Sankuwar, uh, our systems engineer. Both are based in California. Steve has recently joined us and um, prior to Octoscope, he's been with the Wi-Fi Alliance, uh, but he has a long career uh, with wireless, uh, including Philips, uh, where he did some R&D on some cellular technology. Um, and then he's been uh, most active uh, in, in the Wi-Fi Alliance on the coexistence testing with LTE and Wi-Fi on Wi-Fi 6 certification and uh, easy mesh certification. So Steve's the real expert on uh, the topic here that we're going to cover. And uh, Prachi uh, is our uh, systems engineer uh, in the Bay Area in San Jose, also with Steve there. Uh, she's been helping our customers operate the Octobox test beds. Uh, she's also a resident expert on the Wi-Fi Alliance testbed that we have fully automated for certification. Uh, and uh, prior to Octoscope, she's worked at Intel and uh, holds a, a, a master's degree. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm going to let uh, Steve uh, get us started here. Thanks, Fanny. So we've had a lot of questions from folks about um, uh, um, about radio propagation um, radio propagation channels um, and so we thought we'd do um, a tutorial <clears throat> and take um, a bit of a deep dive into um, into some of the aspects of of real world uh, propagation so these kind of fall into two broad categories. Um, the first is line of sight, where the receiver has basically a, a direct view of the transmitter. Um, and the second is, um, is non-line of sight, where the path is, is blocked by a wall or reflected off, to, off, uh, off an obstacle. So you can see in the diagram here, um, there's the, the, the large gray box at the top is acting as a reflector. Uh, the transmitter is uh, the transmitter path reflects off that and uh, impinges on the receiver. Uh, so that is a non-line of sight. A, a non-line of sight. Um, the uh, the other interesting path is from the transmitter um, through a wall to the receiver, and as this diagram depicts is some considerable attenuation uh, going through going through that wall. Um, <coughs> so um, passing through obstacles significantly attenuates the signal. Reflecting off obstacles delays the arrival time at the at the receiver, and it also introduces attenuation. So real world channels have combinations of um, of line of sight several non-line of sight paths, and these um, introduce a number of complexities um, in terms of what the receiver uh, can discern. So typically, um, delayed paths will, call, will cause um, a more complicated frequency response of the channel. It'll introduce nulls and peaks, um, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as attenuation. Um, whereas typically a, a, a line of sight propagation uh, just has a flat frequency response. It's a very simple channel, uh, very useful for a lot of testing. But <clears throat> as we go into um, more sophisticated Wi-Fi, it becomes more and more important to, um, to test the, uh, the capability of a device in, in a real world channel. So this is an image um, showing uh, in frequency and time <clears throat> the different aspects 
that happen in these non-line of sight channels. If you take a look across in frequency, you can see um, you can see nulls that that creep in there, depending on what frequency. Uh, um, you know, depending on the frequency. Um, but you can see also <clears throat> there's variation over time as well. So this is a pretty a pretty complex um, uh, a pretty complex thing for a receiver to deal with, and um, it's important to test their resilience to to these complexities. Um, so <clears throat> with that in mind, um, today we'll study some of these aspects. And we'll learn how to successfully test with them. So I'm going to start off with what we call a power delay profile. So a power delay profile depicts the relationship of attenuation and delay for each path. On the left-hand side, you'll see the transmitter who, um, in the blue there, he's transmitting at time t equals zero. Um, if you look on the far right hand side, you'll see a green path directly from the uh, transmitter to the receiver. That is the line of sight path, and it arrives um, almost at t equals zero at the receiver. Conversely, looking at, for instance, the red path, um, this bounces off a building um, and arrives a little bit later at the receiver. So you will see the impulse at T1 there, that's the delayed path off, um, off of the buildings. You'll notice it's also um, attenuated and that's partly because of the uh, reflection that it underwent, but also because it's a longer distance for it to travel. Same sort of idea with, um, with the, the yellow one. Um, it's bouncing off a building a little bit further away, um, arrives a little bit later than the red one, and it's also attenuated by a bit more too. Likewise for the purple. So <clears throat> this um, power, de power delay profile is a very convenient way to describe um, uh, in a very concise picture uh, what a channel looks like, at least in in the uh, in the time domain. So important to note that it's the physical environment that determines this PDP. Um, there are many different channel models um, that people use to suit the environment that they're interested in. For instance, um, if we were to look at a PDP for the Swiss Alps, you'd find that the delays <clears throat> would be considerably further apart because they're reflecting off very distant objects and they arrive significantly later. Um, if you were to look at an urban model, you'd find these, um, these delays somewhat shorter. And we're, of course, interested in the indoor model. So we'll take a look at that. Um, I'm going to pause at this point. Um, if anybody has any questions or clarifications. Okay, uh, good. Feel free to post your questions or raise your hand and uh, we can have a discussion. All right, so we're, we're gonna focus on an indoor model because um, that's, um, uh, that's typically where, where Wi-Fi lives. Um, and <clears throat> we see in an, in, an indoor model, um, very often a slightly more um, uh, a complex PDP. Um, you'll see that um, in this particular uh, PDP, which is the 802.11 model D, there are actually three clusters of these impulses. Um, now, where do these impulses come from? <clears throat> Best thing to uh, uh, try and get a handle on this is to imagine a cluster of energy that bounces back and forth 
um, off the walls. So each time it bounces, it's a little lower in amplitude. It's a little later in time. And this kind of continues. Um, if you look, for instance, at the red cluster there, that's what's happening there. It's bouncing back and forth, back and forth, becoming attenuated um, each time. General rule of thumb, uh, 10 nanoseconds is 10 feet. If you look at the, um, uh, at the delays between uh, successive uh, uh, red impulses, it's about 10 nanoseconds. And that would give you an indication that the reflectors are in the order of somewhat like 10 feet apart. But there's a second cluster, um, and th this second cluster marked in yellow, you'll see they are spaced sign significantly further apart than the red cluster. And these are from slightly more distant objects. Again, bouncing back and forth, back and forth, um, and gradually decaying. So the Model D, uh, the dot eleven Model D, actually has a third cluster that they feel is important. And again, that's actually spaced in time a little bit more even than, than the yellow. So same, um, uh, same basically physical analogy. Um, and uh, um, so yeah, so this is so this is a good a, a good depiction of uh, of of an indoor um, model. These um, repeated uh, delays um, have an impact on the frequency response of the channel, as we saw in the um, in the in the picture earlier. They cause nulls and peaks in the frequency response of the channel. And we'll see a bit more of that um, later on. Right, so <clears throat> as I mentioned. I'm sorry, Steve, we have a, a hand raised for the oh, last certainly. slide. Um, so Zi Huang, I'm gonna, going to unmute you here. If you have your okay. question, go so ahead. So very quick, when you say this, the rule of thumb, 10 nanosecond, 10 feet, is the 10 feet between the two wall or it's one way or two way. I, my my point is, uh, it's just a. Oh. Well, I was just thinking. Um, speed of light is prob is uh, uh, approximately one nanosecond per foot. Okay. You, so that'll okay. be that'll be to total path length, right? Oh, total path then like a bounce where return. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good question. Um, so as we mentioned, there are a number of different models to suit different, different physical environments. Um, there's been a lot of study done in IEEE, um, <clears throat> uh, a very good paper produced by I think as many as 30 experts in the field. Um, and they came up with a list of uh, typical channel models that are representative of various environments in which Wi-Fi would be used. Um, very interesting paper. I, I'd be happy to share the reference with you if you're interested. Uh, drop me an email um, and, I'll, and I'll get that to you. <clears throat> As you can see, they've got, they've got a number of these here. We looked at Model D a little earlier, and that is uh, a typical it's called typical office. It has certain characteristics. It has, for instance, three clusters and so on. Um, a large outdoor space um, is representative of, you know, much larger distances, um, much more delay, and probably more clusters as well. Now we're focusing on the residential model um, because that's, um, <clears throat> that's uh, uh, very representative um, of a lot of uh, consumer deployments. Actually, our multipath emulator emulates uh, two of the IEEE models defined in that paper. Uh, the first is model A, which as we mentioned is a direct line of sight, flat frequency response, no delays, no spectral nulls. Um, but we also implement model B, which is residential non-line of sight 
has two clusters, um, has, uh, has a delay uh, profile, um, and introduces um, um, uh, frequency nulls and so on in the, um, in the frequency response of the channel. So these are, um, are pretty good um, models, um, quite representative of, um, of a typical environment for Wi-Fi. I'm going to pause if there are any questions at this point. Hey, we have, um, let's see, Devin's asking, is Model A equivalent to an anechoic chamber? Am I pronouncing that right? Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's a direct line of sight. Just think of it, um, transmitter to receiver. They, they can literally see one another. There's no reflections of anything at all. So it's the, it's the simplest, um, it's the simplest uh, channel model that you can get, basically. But it's very useful for a lot of testing, too. So. OK, thanks for the for that question. Um, I'm going to move on. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, we, um, uh, we built the, the MPE to implement Model B for a non-line of sight. Um, and we wanted to compare its time domain um, impulse response and line that up with the power delay profile that was specified by IEEE. So it's pretty difficult to measure, you know, nanosecond spacing and stuff. Um, but one of the uh, uh, easy ways of doing that is to take the frequency response and do a Fourier transform and transform it into the time domain. So that's exactly what you see here, um, is the time domain response. And you'll see the two clusters from the specification depicted by green and the red markers. And then you'll see the lineup of the actual impulse response of the MPE uh, drawn on the chart as well. So they actually line up um, pretty closely. Um, and uh, so this, this kind of proves that this is, uh, this is a, um, a good representation of the, uh, of the of the IEEE Model B. Okay, so now we've looked at the time domain response of a real channel. We've compared it against the IEEE specification, um, and let's take let's zoom out a little bit and take a look and, at what the MPE is. So the MPE, the multipath emulator, um, will uh, will work from pretty much DC to uh, up in the eight gigahertz region. Um, it accurately models that IEEE model B, um, and it has a bypass switch um, in it, which allows you to implement model A as well. So model A is line of sight, as we discussed, and the switches in the diagram uh, down below, show it in line of sight mode. So it's going straight through. We have a programmable attenuator, so we can do rate versus range testing. Um, and when we want to introduce non-line of sight conditions, model B, we just move those two bypass switches um, and enable uh, the, um, uh, the multipath uh, component. So it's a bi-directional uh, four by four MIMO link. Um, the interesting aspect of this multipath emulator is that the forward um, and the reverse path response is identical. So that's uh, very important actually for Wi-Fi, especially when they do channel sounding. Uh, it would be very confusing for the devices if they did channel sounding in one direction but then got a completely different chat response um, in the other direction. <clears throat> so you'll notice um, the picture of, of, the, um, of the device at the top there. You'll see eight SMA connectors. 
um, that shows that it implements four um, uh, uh, four independent channel models. And you notice we don't mark those as either input or output because they serve as both. It's actually a passive implementation. Um, and that is actually one of the unique features that has, um, that has many, uh, many advantages. So <clears throat> uh, part of that is that it gives you a complete symmetry in, in the channel, as we mentioned before. Um, but the other part of that is that you can run with very high dynamic range um, and you don't end up uh, getting mixing products or noise or spurs and, and these kinds of things that uh, one sometimes sees in, um, in other um, uh, uh, faders. <clears throat> it's also very wide bandwidth. Um, so you can use uh, a number of channels uh, simultaneously. Um, so for instance, you could imagine um, that this uh, cluster of devices here could be interspersed across a number of different channels in even the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. You would be able to put them all through the multipath emulator at the same time. Um, and uh, and and operate the system in that in that way. <clears throat> As I mentioned, it's it's a passive Im implementation, so we don't uh, have uh, we don't have to um, demodulate and then perform DSP functions and then remodulate and so on. Um, the problem with that approach is that um, dynamic range is an issue, uh, delay is. Uh, it, it's an issue. And with our system, we can do the full dynamic range of that wireless link, literally from saturation to, to disconnection. Just gonna pause um, for any questions if they are. So Steve, yeah, so John is asking, is the MPE the same thing as a Butler matrix? Uh, good question. No, um, it, it, is, it is not. Um, a, a Butler matrix, um, uh, a Butler matrix um, <clears throat> creates um, <clears throat> an orthogonal representation of a linear combination of all its inputs. Um, a multipath emulator introduces a time delay response. Specifically, these, um, these time delays are associated with a power delay profile. So the, um, <clears throat> the delay through a bunch of matrix will probably look more like just one impulse. Whereas in a multipath, meaning there are multiple different um, time delays as you go through it, it will have um, uh, multiple impulses uh, showing the delayed copies of the signal. I think so, also when we get to the response, we'll see the multipath <coughs> uh, in frequency. So we should just keep going. There's another question, Steve, about the propagation delay uh, for line of sight. And so uh, that's pretty much in, in uh, nanoseconds because it's a passive system. There's nothing active, there's no demodulator, remodulator, there's no sampling, it's, it's just RF. So it's probably picoseconds or you know even, it's just instantaneous propagation delay. So it behaves very much like a house, like you, you, you ping and, and you get some multipath response ringing, bouncing uh, back and forth from the wall. Uh, it's very, very realistic model. And the path loss from the MPE is mostly due to the actual nulls that cut out the power, and you will see. And uh, it depends on the frequency. Steve has some details on it. So if you hang on, uh, Matt will, will cover that uh, path loss uh, question that you have. There's also one, uh, one more question. Uh, what is the range of attenuation? Can MPE expand to support Model C? 
It cannot, it, it only does model B uh, because it has two clusters modeled. Uh, but the attenuation, uh, it, it goes, we have the attenuator range of 60 dB inside, but the multipath itself, when it switches in, it introduces anywhere between 10 and 20 dB is frequency dependent, additional. So you have between the two uh, line of sight and non-line of sight uh, over 80 dB of range. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so model, mod, model C has a very different power delay profile. Um, and that power delay profile is uh, designed to emulate a small office. You'll see if you take a quick look at the chart here, um, you can see that from the numbers. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> one look now at the frequency response um, of the MPE. Here we're looking at it in model A, line of sight um, operation. As we mentioned, it does contain a quad attenuator um, so that you can do rate versus range. Uh, line of sight operation is the red path that we've outlined here uh, with the bypass switch um, in that position. And this is the frequency response in this configuration. So pretty much DC to uh, well above uh, seven and a half gigahertz um, up into the eight gigs. Um, there's very little, um, or there is some droop in, across the frequency range, but it is a huge, huge frequency range. Um, if you take a look, if you were to zoom in for instance, take the 2.4 gigahertz channel, um, you'll see it's, pr it's pretty much flat across the 60 megahertz or so that the uh, uh, 2.4 gig ISM band um, um, offers. And again, if you were to look at it just zoomed in around five gigahertz, you would find it's uh, to all intents and purposes uh, completely flat within even quite a wide bandwidth than five gigahertz. So this is uh, this is really um, uh, this is you know this is just a huge uh, uh, frequency span, but it gives you some idea of of the of the flatness. Um, we're going to move now and zoom in to uh, and look at um, at what happens when we go to non line of sight operation. Rem remembering that uh, in non-line of sight we have these delayed copies that arrive at the receiver um, spaced by those impulses in the power delay profile and they cause uh, frequency dependent uh, changes, so nulls and peaks. And this picture here um, <clears throat> gives you an illustration of that channel. So we are now, we've now moved these switches to incorporate the multipath. We still have the attenuator so we can do rate versus range, um, but we're now implementing IEEE model B um, and just take a look at the, at the frequency response. It's pretty complex. Um, there are lots of spectral nulls uh, attenuations and stuff going on. Um, there's um, e e even the attenuation which you would expect um, as you increase frequency in the real world as well. So again, this is the full bandwidth, uh, DC to well over seven, seven gigs. Um, and we're gonna zoom into this a little bit more and take a look at um, what this looks like if we were to zoom into the ISM band. So at this point, I'm just going to pause and see if there are any questions. We do okay. have one. Um, is the time variant or not? It is not time variant, uh, it is a fixed model. It is equivalent of an empty house where nobody moves. Basically. There are no moving reflectors. It's basically everybody stands still. But you can have time variance in this system. 
For example, a lot of our customers place a device on a turntable. And as the turntable rotates, you do get some Doppler and some frequency shifts from, with the test antennas. And this is something we'll cover in our next session next week. Uh, we have some other um, questions. Why are the nodes deeper in six gigahertz? Uh, that's that's the model. It's the exact model, and that's how it looks. Uh, in yeah. if you <clears throat> build Pot a house to this model, that's what you would get when you do a ping. It'll ring yeah. like that. Uh, part of it, I think, to be honest, is um, is the measurement capabilities of the test instrument. So we, I mean, we're looking over a huge frequency range here, and sometimes these. Um, these nulls are so narrow that that they kind of get lost in the quantization of the of the measurement instrument. Um, if you zoom into these things, um, you, you you probably get a bit a, a big a better picture. Okay, you've got another question here uh, from Lincoln uh, for the plot that showed the three D channel with frequency, amplitude, and time. Most channel models would not vary in time unless the receiver transmitter moving, correct? Or the reflectors could move too. And that or the reflectors uh, could move. Uh, yeah, yeah. Indeed. And so, Absolutely. Yeah. So when we rotate on a turntable, <clears throat> we can control that also. And then there is yeah, another question. Uh, is the channel model symmetrical for the subcarriers within the OBDMA bandwidth? Aha. Uh -huh. uh, you want to take a crack at that one, Steve? Is the channel model symmetrical? The channel model, in terms of delay profile, is symmetrical. In therefore, in terms of frequency, it is, it is symmetrical in terms of uplink and downlink. Yes. Um, uh, perhaps we'll move to the next slide, and that may uh, uh, that may help answer the OFDMA uh, question. So. Okay, so, there's another question. What instrument does it work with? Will you talk about it later? Um, yeah, it works with, you can put uh, real devices, uh, off-the-shelf devices across it, or you can use our PAL instrument. And we can cover that in the demo as well. We'll show a live demo of it. Yeah, so that's a very good question, actually. So th this is a model of the channel, and it is valid for Wi-Fi signals. It's valid for Bluetooth signals. It's valid for smart grid signals, uh, anything that would use uh, a residential, in a residential type environment, this path model is exactly valid. It's, it's a representation of a physical model. And it's not tied to any type of device. It's, it's kind of nature doing its work, right? Yeah, exactly. There's another question, Steve, is uh, from uh, Jim Hackett. Is the MTE frequency response shown here the same for all spatial streams? Okay, so spatial streams, uh, it's, it's the same, it, it's basically a frequency response, but the spatial streams come into play when we have antennas in the chamber. And that's where you can have multiple streams uh, originating from different angles of arrival. And it's a function of how we hang the antenna. So that's another part of the model. And, and the answer is uh, you can have spatial streams. We, we've, we have now we can do eight spatial streams with eight antennas that we, uh, we, we keep them um, at low correlation. If we have to control that. But that's the over-the-air part of the test bed. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so that's a good point. The channel model itself, the MPE, um, is identical. But as soon as you hook an antenna and you start talking about different angles of arrival, if you, you know, convolve that with the, with the response of the, of the MPE, you will, you will hopefully get different frequency responses for your different antenna placements. Okay, I'm gonna um, <clears throat> move on we're going to zoom in now into um, what this uh, complicated response looks like in the 2.4 gig band. So here uh, I'm showing um, just, just the 2.4 gig band. We've zoomed in here and you can see these, uh, um, you can see uh, 
the spectral null here. I'm going to move on to uh, take a zoom in at the five gig, uh, five gigahertz band, which is um, perhaps a bit more interesting. Um, <clears throat> and here I've looked at um, four 20, 20 megahertz, uh, four 20 megahertz bands, uh, 36 through 48. So it's much wider bandwidth than we looked at in 2.4 gig. Um, and you can see there's a, actually an extra um, uh, spectral null that is that is crept in there. So this is this is is pretty representative um, of a typical channel response that you would get uh, in in a house as well. Um, it's part of the reason why you get so-called dead spots in some places in the house. You may find that if you change the channel for that same place in the house, you actually get a very much better reception. So these are all complexities that are not just immediately apparent unless you, you know, and unless you actually start doing some of this testing. Okay. Um, so we've discussed line of sight. We've discussed non-line of sight. Um, we've discussed the fact that um, as, you as you move out of line of sight into non-line of sight, uh, typically, you know, you've moved into another room. You, you're now going through a wall. And so you would expect, you know, a dip in attenuation and the introduction of some of the multipath as well. The question is, how do we do this in uh, in an automated setup, in you know an orderly and a controlled way? And so I'm going to pass you on to Prachi, who is going to explain uh, explain how this is done, um, and look at um, uh, some of the results, and then she's going to give us a demo. So Prachi, if you would like to take it away. Yeah, Steve. Um, so, okay, thank you. Um, so the slide you see on the screen right now um, shows you um, our MPE line of sight, non-line of sight control. So the image you see on the right, um, this is how we add MPE on our software UI. So the training interval and the step duration you see, the step duration means after how many seconds you want the attenuation to ramp up. Uh, you can specify the start and stop attenuation values, and you can also specify uh, in what steps. So you can specify 5 dB or 10 dB according to what you need to test. There is a line of sight and non line of sight threshold um, value which you can enter. So whatever value enter, whatever value you enter here. So suppose you enter 10 dB, so that will be the threshold. So at 10 dB. Um, there will be a transition from line of sight to non line of sight mode. And um, our MPE has a switch over. So in line of sight, it behaves as a normal attenuator. And when it crosses the threshold, uh, it switches over to uh, the multipath. So you can go to the next slide, Steve. Okay. So this is the picture you see on the right is what I'm going to demo uh, very shortly. Um, so what, what we are doing in the test is we are setting the threshold, uh, the transition threshold to 10 dB and we are stepping up the attenuator in 5 dB steps. So you will see that um, in the diagram uh, when uh, the MP is in the line of sight mode, so it behaves as a normal attenuator. So it, the, the highlighted portion is in red at, in the top block diagram. And as soon as it, it, and as soon as it transitions and it, and it crosses the 10 dB, uh, 10 dB mark, it uh, switches over to the multipath. Um, so I'm just gonna dive into the demo for you guys. Uh, Steve, if I can have control. So Prashi, oh, I'm sorry, Prachi, there was a question that may have gone with the previous slide, but they're asking what's the minimum step to configure? Um, so I guess I have, I have used a minimum step of three. So you, uh, you can use three, five, whatever. You, uh, the, what, the minimum step is half a dB. 
half a degree. You okay. can go in half a degree step. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Bunny. Sure. Uh, right. Yes, you have you have the RSSI. So let's see the demo. Oh, the question is, do we have feedback for the actual attenuation of N loss for MP? Yes. You'll see a step in the RSSI. All right. So let's. Okay. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So okay. Um, on the left side here, you can see uh, that there is an R instrument panel. Uh, so I'm running a downlink traffic to my Staypal, uh, and this window here under auto test attenuators is where I have included, uh, I have added two MPEs to give it a full eight by eight uh, signal space. Um, so this here, I'm just uh, specifying the values. So I'm just going to start the test and show you guys. Okay. Okay, so we are running Wi-Fi 6. So we can see that we are getting an MCS of 11 here. Um, and on, on, on the left, if you see, we have a sliding scale. So right now, uh, the attenuation is 10 dB. So the threshold is set to 10 dB. And, you, and once it switches, once it crosses the threshold, now it's on 15 dB. So you can see here the RSSI. Um, it went from minus 50 um, to minus 70. So that means you have just crossed the wall and you can see the drop in the throughput, right? And like in the UI, you can see that we, we were running in M at MCS 11. Initially, when we were in line of sight mode, we were getting a data rate of 2400. Um, our Staypal is a two stream device um, and we are operating at um, 160 megahertz. So yeah, you can see the drop in the RSSI as soon as we transition from line of sight to non line of sight. And uh, yeah, so this and this is this is a stack max. So this is available online. So you can you guys can like access it and then have a look at this test. So Prachi, there's a question who reports the RSSI? Uh, your, your power sensor. It's we're running Prachi is running. She we have some slides with the test configuration. But she's using one of our instruments we call a PAL. And this is running between a state PAL. It's a PAL based on the station chip set that we have. And, and a, an ASUS AP, correct? Yes. Through yes. the, through eight, actually two MPs, we have eight paths through them. Mm -hmm. so, so we will show you the setup. And the PAL is reporting their RSSI. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. So I guess Steve, you can just go ahead and uh, start sharing your screen. Okay. Will you give me? Yeah, sure. Oh, yes. One second. One second. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let me. Okay, so um, yeah, so I think it's a good um, uh, part in the um, in the session to to open it up for uh, for qu uh, questions and answers. If anybody uh, has, did did you uh, want to uh, show the test setup too? Uh, yeah, certainly we can. So this is this is what we call um, uh, stack max. Um, I think we're seeing your slides, Steve. Oh. Okay, so measuring throughput, uh, we, uh, the question is what tool are we using to measure throughput? Uh, so we use our own tool we call MultiPerf. MultiPerf um, is uh, it's a managed endpoint that can do multipoint to multipoint under it. It does run inside iPerf3 and we're soon adding iPerf2 as well. And MultiPerf has uh, a capability to report a lot of statistics and information as well. Are you able to see my screen now? Uh, yes, we can. Yes, and then no. there's another question. Can you guys please share multipath load for different IEEE profiles? Um, for, for profiles meaning models, um, 
I don't think we have it handy, but we can uh, we can follow up with you, Farron, maybe afterwards. Okay, I think we're done with questions. Sorry. Okay. Um, this is this is this is our stack max, which is um, uh, set up to run a wide variety of uh, of test cases. Um, we make use of these high gain antennas to to couple um, to the device. You see the top um, duct chamber open there. You'll see the uh, directional antennas. Um, it's got an AP on the turntable, um, and um, and that allows us to measure uh, rate versus range as we rotate the AP. Um, I want to draw your attention to um, the box on the lower <laughs> section, if you can see my cursor. This is the PAL box. Um, this is a rather unique um, box insofar as it has 16 uh, individual uh, stay pals. So they are um, they're, they're either either Linux or Windows based, but they're 16 individual um, stay pals and they can be used um, as sniffers um, or as stations or as combinations of those. So um, that's something that you may want to uh, want to look at a little bit more. Um, this is this is more of a diagrammatic view. Um, you can see the test that we've been running. We have had an ASUS uh, access point in the smart box up top here. Um, we've been using a stay pal in the pal box, and here are the two uh, two MPEs. Any questions or comments on that so far? So are you testing the AP as a DOT? We can test an AP or a station. We yeah. have, in this particular test bed is optimized for AP device under test, but we have other topologies that are more suited for station. Yeah. I mean, by all means, could put an access point um, up here you can put a station under test in this box over here. Um, that would, you know, that gives you the versatility. Um, uh, in this configuration, actually, um, these three boxes down the center can be configured um, as, as a three node mesh network. And then you can have uh, a stay under test um, on the left hand side here. And you can uh, cause that to roam between the three APs, so that's uh, that's fairly fairly versatile. Um, yeah, this is what we call. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry, Steve. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that the the box on the left that we have we call a smart box stay. Um, it it has four stay pals in it, and those are useful to run as sniffers, um, uh, especially useful to run as sniffers actually. So we have four sniffer probes. Um, you can put a probe um, in, in each of the boxes um, and then we can combine um, the output of, of each of those sniffer probes into one uh, Wireshark uh, screen. Sorry, Fanny. Yeah, no worries, sir. My my bad. It's the timing with the zoom is hard to control. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so we highlighted in red the part of the test bed we're actually using, and so the the goal for these seminars is we're going to go through little by little and exercise each part of this test bed and show you what it's for and what it does. Uh, now next time. Uh, we're going to use the turntable that you see, uh, and we're going to show you a, a few tests that we do with the turntable. Please go ahead, Steve. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, we pretty much um, at the end of our, um, our material for today, 
uh, thank you for listening. Um, I hope that you found it useful. As Fanny mentioned, um, we, we're going to run a series of these things. Um, we get questions about stuff all the time. Um, and uh, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's often useful just to spend a little bit of time and dig into these topics. Um, we're trying to keep this mainly technical um, with a view to, you know, to, uh, to learning a little bit about, uh, about some aspects of Wi-Fi, some aspects of how to test it and so on. Wi-Fi 6 is very interesting insofar as um, legacy Wi-Fi is pretty much an AP and a stay and, you know, you can, it, it's a relatively simple setup. Wi-Fi 6 was really designed to be deployed in dense environments. Now, if you want to test its performance in dense, uh, dense environments, you have to create dense environments, right? Um, and so there, uh, there are different ways uh, that we can do that. We'll touch on that topic uh, later on as well. So in the meantime, um, if you have a topic of particular interest to you, please don't hesitate to shoot me a note. Um, uh, we'll try and put something together. We want to make these things relevant. Um, and, and if there's, there's a topic or a question, um, uh, you know, please, uh, uh, please feel free to contact me. I, I'm based in, uh, in uh, California in the Bay Area. Um, and so, uh, yeah, pl uh, feel free to reach out. Okay, so there's one more question. Uh, was the demo tested on the red path correct? It was, we highlighted the red, in red the path that we use. And we actually use two MPs. Each one of them is four by four. We use two of them for an eight by eight path because our PAL6 is actually an eight by eight device. And so we can set up links that are eight by eight, eight by two, for example, with the, with the two by two station and an eight by eight AP. But we use eight paths in that test bed. And you can have more paths than streams, right? That's theoretical. Uh, and so more paths is usually better. It gives you better environment for MIMO. So we're using eight paths here for this test. It right. looks like we have a couple more questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes. So, um, instead of the attenuation, can we plot a polar plot as per the real RSI? Yes, you can do RSSI. We actually have throughput versus RSSI. Uh, I think it also works as polar plot. Let me find out for sure. But definitely throughput versus RSSI is available uh, on the charts and uh, Prachi may even be able to pull it up. One of the, <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, useful things is um, all of these KPIs we store in, in a database. Um, and since all our instruments um, are time synchronized using uh, PTP. Um, uh, you can pull out this data uh, and po post process it very easily. So, if you want to construct a diagram that is not shown uh, in our uh, uh, UI, um, you you can pull out a CSV file or a JSON file, and you can very easily extract. Uh, the information and create whatever plot uh, you you have uh, interest in doing. Uh, we pretty much do that. Uh, I've seen seen people do that quite a lot. All right then. <clears throat> um, if there. Okay, no there's another another question. Uh, is PAL six, PAL one, etc. Yeah. So uh, in the PAL box, we have a PAL six, uh, which is based on on the Qualcomm chipset for the AP, uh, and uh, we also have 16 state PALs that we we number them 
from 1 to 16 uh, for ease of kind of addressing them. Uh, but there is an interesting way that the state paths are, there are four groups of four state paths drive corner antennas in the, in the uh, device under test box. And, and so we can do multi-user MIMO with up to four of them and, and also OFDMA at the same time. It's a pretty powerful test bed. And as we go through these tutorials, we'll be showing you more and more capabilities there. So, yeah, so Steve's showing. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Sorry. I'll I'll hand it back uh, to you. If you have any concluding remarks. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of controls. So there's a. Do we have any special control with um, supporting six E and state pass? Okay. So we have a question. What's your schedule for six E and state pass? So we're we're going to support it when the chipsets come out. Uh, for 6E, it's probably end of the year or, or Q1 of next year for our PAL. And, uh, and state PAL is the same. It's, we're using currently Intel AX200 chipset. So as soon as there is a, a version of, out there of uh, extended frequency, we'll be updating it. Um, and then uh, do we have special control? We, just have, we do have control. Uh, we have uh, actually a lot of control over PAL-6. Uh, it's based on the Hawkeye chipset. We have access to the firmware and all the registers. And we, we turn the, the PAL-6 into an instrument. And we'll be showing some of those capabilities. Uh, so we can control things like uh, MCS, number of streams. Uh, we can emulate uh, virtual stations uh, using PAL-6. On the state pile, we have a little less control, but we, we still have a fair amount of control for the driver. Um, enabling, disabling capabilities like, um, you know, security and uh, TWT and, and KVR and stuff like that. Uh, we get all the statistics from the driver that we plot, um, that you saw. So, so we, we do have a varying amount of control over the different PALs. Do you have boxes for other models? Uh, we don't have other models. We only have uh, model B, which is a model of a house, which, which is completely broadband and uh, completely symmetric. But um, we don't do a programmable pay there. And, and so you, if you need other models, um, that would have to be kind of hardwired. That's how we do it in RF. And we haven't done that. Okay, let's see what else. You've got more questions. Oh, in the future, we don't plan, we don't plan other models. In the future, most of our customers are testing in the house. So that's the model they need. All right. Well, thank you all very much. We appreciate your joining. It's, it's great to see so many people online. Uh, and uh, we hope you'll join us again soon.